The Department of Public Health and Human Services is pleased to bring you aging horizons medicare medicaid social security fraud legal issues veterans benefits and caregiving aging horizons is a program dedicated to inform and prepare montanans on these timely issues making a difference to you and your loved ones here now is today's program host hi everyone today on aging horizons we're going to be taking a look at the cultural diversity of montana we have with us Ellen Baumler of the Montana Historical Society, and we're going to be looking at populations in Montana all oh, 100 years or so ago. You might be surprised at how very different they were. We have a lot of really fun stuff to tell you about, so stay tuned. You mean I can get help paying my prescription drug premiums? Let me get this straight. I could be eligible for help with my family's prescription premiums even though I own my own home? And our assets won't be counted. If you're a Montana resident enrolled in the Medicare Prescription Drug Program, you could be eligible for help paying your premiums. Call or visit the Big Sky Rx website today to find out, even if you think you're over income. What do you know about that? I'm eligible. Every generation produces heroes. Men and women who step forward to defend our country in time of need, no matter the personal cost to themselves. And though we can never fully repay them, we can make sure they have access to low-cost, long-term care when they need it. That's what Montana's Veterans Homes are all about. If you've got a hero in need in your family, call us. We can help. Here in Montana, we love our outdoor activities. Unfortunately, few of them are risk-free. Indeed, Montana is second in the nation per capita in head injuries that can destroy the lives of people we love. That's why you should insist your family always wear protective helmets. But you can do even more. When you fill out your vehicle registration this year, circle the Y and donate a dollar to support traumatic brain injury prevention and education. Now that's using the old noggin. Sometimes when it's winter, we have to wear our coats inside so we don't get cold. My mommy says the heat is too expensive. Once, when it was really, really cold, I even had to wear my coat to bed. This winter, your family's health and well-being depend on staying warm. If today's high fuel costs have you worried, help is available for both renters and homeowners. Call us today to find out if you qualify. When you're cold, nothing is any fun. Hi everyone and welcome to Aging Horizons brought to you by the Department of Public Health and Human Services. I'm your host Kimmy Everman and today we're going to be talking about a kind of a different subject uh, than normal. We're going to be talking about cultural diversity in Montana um, many many years ago and as I said in our open, you might be very surprised at what you hear. We have with us Ellen Baumler from the Montana Historical Society. Welcome, Ellen. Thank Ellen, you for having me. It's always so great to have you Thank here. Thank you for having me back. <laughs> so, you know, we, um, we might be surprised at the cultural diversity of right. Montana right. a few more than a hundred years ago or yeah, so. Yeah. Um, tell us about it. Well, you know, I think that we do forget that so many people came here because of the gold rush. Right. And the gold rush drew people really from every corner of the world. And on the streets of Virginia City um, and Helena back in the 1860s, you could hear virtually almost every language spoken. We just, you know, we don't really think about that. Right. But, um, you know, one of the largest ethnic groups that came were the Chinese. And the Chinese um, made up 10% of the territorial population in 1870. Of course, 1870 was when the first census was taken. We have no idea really what that population was like in 1862 right. or 63 until that first census. Right. But even with that first census, the population of Chinese was 10%. In Helena, it was 20% Chinese. In Virginia City, it was 28%. Wow. Chinese, you know. So very large um, population mm -hmm. of Chinese folks came. And they came, you know, because of the gold rush. Mm -hmm. And uh, they came uh, leaving their families, 
for the most part and um, uh, really hope to make a fortune. And like you everybody said that else. <laughs> they, yeah, mm -hmm. that they came al almost exclusively yep. from one region right. of southern China. Right. They came from an area called uh, Guangdong, which mm -hmm. is in the southern part of China. And even more specifically than that, to me, it's just absolutely amazing that most of them came from this little county within Guangdong called Toy San. And it is, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really just bizarre that so many, many Chinese came from that one little yeah. area. And today, I think if you ask uh, Chinese folks who, uh, who live here, whose maybe parents came here, they will tell you that that's where they're from. Wow. You know, so, and that's true not just of Montana, it's also true of the West. And it's also true of Australia and New Zealand. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wouldn't yeah. you like to know why? Yeah. I, yeah. I'd love to know why. Yeah, so the reason that so many of them came from uh, that one little area, the gold rushes, we kind of have to go back to the gold rushes in California when gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill in 1848. Um, word traveled across the Pacific to the, to the uh, country of China in three months. Now, if you think about how long it took word to travel to the eastern seaboard. Yes. It was a very difficult trip. You went by boat around the Horn of South America. It took almost a year, a year and a half, for word to get to uh, the eastern seaboard. So they didn't even know about the gold strike. And right. by the time the 49ers came, uh, there were already many Chinese had established mining camps there. And the reason that they came in such great numbers from China is because in Guangdong, particularly in Toisan, there was a, a civil war raging. Oh, okay. 20 million people in Toisan died during this long-standing civil war. There was also overpopulation. There was a famine. People were really desperate, mm -hmm. and they were desperate to find any way that they possibly could to make money to support their families. families sure. And so it was single men, married men who left their families who came, meaning that it was a very bizarre, very large, but very bizarre population that right. really couldn't increase. Right. Yeah. And, and speaking of that, mm -hmm. you um, had said something about the Exclusion Act, and I wish you'd talk a little bit about that, right. because that's pretty big. Right. Well, you know, uh, placer mining began to dwindle, okay? And um, when that happens, placer gold is the gold that's closest to the, the surface and easy, easily extracted. And so most of these men were placer mining, and there were so many of them. The feeling, I think, in the United States at the time was a lot of discrimination that mm -hmm. was going on. And part of it was because they believed that the Chinese were competing with, you know, with laborers here, with miners here, right. which really isn't true. But, um, but that was the but perception. That was the perception. So in 1882, the federal um, government passed the Chinese Exclusion Act, which was the first act against an ethnic immigrating group mm. in the United States. And it was specifically against the Chinese. And it said that no skilled or unskilled laborers chi of Chinese extraction could come into the United States. Very small numbers of professional people were allowed to come if they could prove that they were doctors or, or um, uh, service providers of some sure. kind. Those folks could come, but in very small numbers. And so the Chinese Exclusion Act um, really did uh, prevent families from coming over, and that's sure. why this, there was this large male population. Yeah, yeah. And, and it also came right on the cusp of the building of the uh, Northern Pacific Railroad across the Northwest. And as placer mining dwindled, all of these men who were here, <laughs> Chinese men, not just in Montana but elsewhere too, needed some other way to make a living. Sure. And so uh, Henry Villard, who was the president of the Northern Pacific decided to hire 15,000 Chinese workers. To work on the railroad. Yes. Well, folks, we have a whole lot more to talk about. We're going to find out what happened to that Exclusion Act, how long that was around, and the kind of impact that it had uh, on that Chinese population. Um, we're also going to talk just a little bit more about what they were doing and uh, the kind of work that they did. So we want you to stay tuned. We have a lot more to tell you about.
you sure you can see? Yeah. Are the headlights on? Yes. Do we need chains? No. Need to slow down? You know, you're probably right. Winterize your vehicle, then winterize your mind. Stay clear of snow plows until they pull over, and it's safe to pass. Drive safely and arrive alive. The face of the American workforce is changing. People are healthier, living longer, and living better. Baby boomers are a valuable resource for the workplace of today and tomorrow. They're still active and eager to help. Experience, dedication, wisdom, these are just some of the significant assets older workers bring to the job. Age, an asset. Experience, a benefit. How are you filing your taxes this year? Let MontanaFreeFile.org help. We offer tax assistance, and like the name says, it's free. We can also help you receive your maximum refund in as little as eight days, at no charge. Want to get started? Just click on any of these tabs. It's all the information you'll need. Great step-by-step -step instruction and completely free. Log on to MontanaFreeFile.org or call 800-666-6899. This tax season, don't just file, free file. Energy Share helped me in 2008 and I was able to repay them. This year with family and health issues, they came through for me again. I'm a veteran. Energy Share helped me when I needed it and I wanted others to know that it's available. I was going through a really hard time in my life and Energy Share gave me the assistance I needed so the stress in my life would be less. Thank you, Energy Share. If you need help with your heating bills, call Energy Share at 888-779-7589 or visit us at energyshareMT.com. Hi everyone, welcome back to Aging Horizons. We're here with Ellen Baumler of the Montana Historical Society today. And we're talking about uh, cultural diversity in Montana and what that looked like uh, before the, t the turn of uh, the 1900s. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, when we left, Ellen, we were talking uh, a little bit about railroad workers right. and the fact that so many of these Chinese, mostly men, mm -hmm. um, went to work for the Northern Pacific Railroad. Right. That's right, they did. Henry Villard hired 15,000, maybe as many as 17,000 Chinese workers because they worked at a, a lower rate than, than Italians and oh. Irish. But he did, he did, you know, also hire Italians and Irish to work on the railroad. And, and it was horrible, hor horribly hard work. Um, you, usually each Chinese person had one tool and they did one particular job. Um, the uh, the work was just backbreaking, and you know, Chinese men are basically of smaller stature, right. really. So it was extremely hard on them. And uh, sometimes um, Henry Villard did uh, recruit people directly from China, mm -hmm. even though it was on the cusp of this Exclusion Act. He had some poll in Congress, and brought people from China. Uh, he recruited people from Canada, and also. Uh, from the United States, mm. but um, the ones that came from China oftentimes signed on with a company. And if they came uh, with a company, uh, oftentimes they were offered insurance. Um, and uh, this insurance said that if they died while they were here on foreign soil, the bone collectors would come through and would collect their remains and take them back to China, which was a really important thing because culturally it's very important, um, according to Chinese religions, that ancestors take care of your, or that you have someone to take care of your, um, of your, your remains, your, your grave. Yeah. And so um, most of them having no family here, you know, it was very important. Mm -hmm. So there were so many accidents along the railroad grades. Um, that they were actually buried very close there in shallow graves so the bone collectors could come through and easily find them and, and take them. So there was an actual job there was, called a bone collector. Yes, yes, there was. And um, they made these great sweeps through the camps and through the, the mining camps mm -hmm. also, which is, I think, a very, it's a very interesting thing. And also, um, it was very, very dangerous work. Of course, there were lots of accidents. There were explosions. Oh, yeah. but, but even more than that, there were rail cars that followed the different ethnic groups working on the on the on laying the tracks and as they would lay the tracks the, the trains would come behind them and these trains were stores 
that provided food for Italians oh. or for Irishmen or for Chinese. Culturally based Culturally foods. based stores, yes. Okay. And so they would buy, uh, the Chinese would buy mostly preserved goods. And so their diet wasn't very good. Mm -hmm. And there are these uh, uh, newspaper reports of the Chinese by the hundreds fishing in the Clark Fork River because that was probably the most difficult area mm -hmm. of laying the tracks. And, and they were trying to supplement their diet, you know. But even so, um, many, many of them died of scurvy. Oh, dear. Uh, and archaeology has revealed recently um, in the railroad camps that one of the one of the main things that they find are remains of opium use. Oh. And that's because they were in such terrible pain. Sure. You know, such hard work. We didn't have aspirin until 1893. Mm -hmm. And so this was really the way that they could ease their pain. And right. it was part of their um, their culture anyhow. Right. But we do find a lot of those remains in archaeological sites related to the railroad. Perhaps. Sure. Uh, and I imagine that, yeah. didn't, that didn't help their health very much. Well, probably not. Probably not. I think they were, they were underweight and they were probably... Um, very uncomfortable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, how did these how did these men survive this, Ellen? This is this sounds like real hardship. It, this this was a real real hardship, and I think that you know one of the main ways that they they did survive was by keeping their identities and keeping their culture, which is really important. Mm -hmm. um, the language is such a barrier, um, and their cultural practices were so different from everyone else's that you know, yes, they did suffer for terrible discrimination and there were many laws besides the Exclusion Act that were passed against the Chinese. Um, in fact, in 1909, there was an anti-miscegenation act which said that Asian people and, um, and African American people couldn't marry whites. And oh. that was on the books. That was a Montana law that was on the books until 1953. Oh, wow. So, I mean, that's another reason Chinese didn't marry here, mm -hmm. you know. Sure. And so the, uh, many of them wanted to go back home um, and really just didn't, could never afford it. We have mm -hmm. a wonderful artifact that is an embellished, beautifully uh, uh, embroidery embellished uh, pouch and it was donated to the Montana Historical Society with its contents intact. And in that pouch was a comb, a flint case for making fire, uh, and a letter from this person's brother saying, don't worry about uh, making a lot of money. Just get enough to buy a ticket home and come home so that uh, mother doesn't have to worry about sure. you anymore. But the tragedy is that this pouch survived intact, so the person probably never made right. it home. And the things that were inside that pouch were clearly what were most important what to that person. What were most important to the person, mm -hmm. exactly right. So what do you think we've, what have we learned from, from some of these experiences? Well, I think, you know, one thing that we have learned is that it is really important to preserve our, our cultural ties right. and to, pr to pres preserve our identities because if we don't preserve our individuality, then we're just like everybody else, right. you know? Right. And so the beauty of the Chinese who came here is that the stories are very hard to find because of the language barrier, but it's also, uh, there's such treasure. Yes. You know, what, what we do know is, is, is really excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Folks, we have a whole lot more to tell you about. Don't go anywhere. We want you to learn along with us. It was a beautiful day. There was about two square feet of ice near the door, which I slid on and fell, cracking one rib. And I became somewhat frightening for me to walk outside, particularly in the winter. The Stepping On program came as kind of a surprise to me. I didn't know about it. I've learned the importance of proper balance. I think anybody uh, who has fallen or is afraid of falling would benefit from this program. Life is made of stories, stories that we all share. But some of us have a hard time reading due to a vision, reading, or physical disability. The Montana Talking Book Library is here to help. Call 1-800-332-3400 to learn if you qualify for this free service, because no story should go untold.
In Montana, we know all about responsibility and personal accountability. Don't pay another medical bill that you don't understand. Take charge. Review your medical bills and call your provider right away if you have questions. If your bills are too confusing, call Montana SMP, the Senior Medicare Patrol. Call 800-551-3191 and get connected directly to a local office. Call Montana SMP today. All across Montana, people are making a difference. Well, my Arthritis Foundation exercise program is a lifesaver to all the participants that are in it. I get down to pick up a piece of trash and when I do it up I started walking backwards down the steps I managed to stay up because of the a lot of the exercise we do mm -hmm. helps with the balance my lifesaver for more information visit dphhs.mt.gov slash arthritis hey folks welcome back to aging horizons we're talking with Ellen Baumler from the Montana Historical Society about cultural diversity in Montana Ellen, um, we wanted to just, I, I wanted to anyway, um, just talk a little bit about uh, the Exclusion Act again. Right. And when that actually right. um, sort of wrapped up. Right. Well, the, um, the Federal Exclusion Act was renewed a number of different times. In 1902, it was renewed as the Geary Act, and people know it as, as that. And it really wasn't, um, it wasn't rescinded until 1943. Mm. And 1943 really did open up immigration to families and, and other uh, Chinese folks who wanted to come to sure. the United States. But yeah, it was a very, very long, you know, very long time. So um, it's, uh, it, it's just one of those things that points to the terrible discrimination that extended into yeah. the 20th century. And, you know, uh, the driving of the, of the Golden Spike, the right. meeting of the two halves of the Northern Pacific Railroad is really a good example of the prejudice because um, that painting is at the head of the grand staircase in the Capitol. It's the only piece of art that Governor Toole himself didn't choose. The Northern Pacific said, we get to decide what's oh, in wow. that. Yeah. And so if you look at that, if you look at that painting, um, there are Irish and uh, um, Italian workers with their hats held high in the back. There are Native Americans over whose land the tracks crossed and all of the officials, but there's no Chinese wow. in that painting. So it's, you know, it speaks volumes, yes. really. Quite yeah. ironic yeah. When, you, when you think it, about it. It is. Yeah, it is. Now, uh, Ellen, there is an exhibit over at the Montana Historical Society that we want to talk about. Yep. Uh, it runs through the 25th of June, and mm -hmm. it's called Our Forgotten Pioneers. Yes. Tell us about it. So it was a huge, huge undertaking for the Historical Society because not only is this a very sensitive topic, right. um, those of us who uh, were involved wanted to tell a story that really the historical society has never told before. Mm -hmm. And that is a story that we've been talking about of these many men who came and, you know, gave everything really and came and many of them died here. Some right. of them went back to China, but many of them did die here in Montana. And so um, we wanted to tell that story. We wanted to show why they came. Uh, for mining and for the railroad. We wanted to show the discrimination against them, and we wanted to show how they kept their culture here. Yeah. And so we have uh, several different vignettes that show um, Chinese laundries. That was one way um, if they men weren't going to mine, not everybody could mine. Right. Um, and that was one way they could actually make a living because everybody needed that service, especially in the mining camps. So we have a Chinese laundry with some wonderful artifacts that we borrowed from the World Museum of Mining in Butte. Oh, wow. And um, we reached out, you know, to a lot of different organizations and, and got a lot of uh, artifacts borrowed, but we also at the Historical Society have a fabulous, fabulous Chinese collection mm -hmm. that had never seen the light of day, too. Really? So, yes. Yeah, so it's very exciting. One of the other ways they kept their culture um, was by um, um, attending temple, and most of these urban Chinese communities had um, temples. If you lived in China with a family, you would have a family altar, but 
most of these people didn't have real homes and they didn't have families. So the temple, the community temple, was a place of refuge. It was a place where they uh, could go and socialize. And um, we have a beautiful, beautiful altar that um, conservators spent weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks restoring. Wow. And it has bats and silkworm moths carved in it. And uh, it is really a, just a fantastically beautiful, beautiful piece of art. But we have all the accoutrements that went with it, altar mm -hmm. cloths and all of that kind of thing. And this was a way and for it, them to really survive some of the It really was a way for them difficulty. to survive, mm -hmm. absolutely. The language was such a barrier, you know, most, most Chinese really couldn't and didn't assimilate. And so it was very important to, you know, keep that fraternity going. Mm -hmm. um, and it was really the only way that they could survive. Uh, so we have the, we have the temple mm -hmm. vignette, and then we have an apothecary shop that is modeled after Dr. Huey Pak in um, Butte, mm -hmm. who was a very famous physician. He uh, was famous partly for his banana leaf poultices that he he marketed through the mail, mm -hmm. and when the um, when the uh, Spanish influenza happened in 1918, he was about the only person that could actually cure people of that Spanish wow. influence. So he became, you know, very well known. He also cured uh, William A. Clark's daughter of an ulcer when nobody else could. Very, very prominent uh, Chinese physician here in Montana. And so, yes. So, uh, you know, even though there were many, many more um, not success stories, we do yes. see some really we nice do success see some, stories. We do see some su success stories, but even with Huey Pock, you know, he died and uh, his son squandered his fortune. He was kept in a butte mortuary, his remains were, until 1953. He died in 1929. And finally, but this is the beauty of the story, mm -hmm. he was finally buried with no marker. And in 2006, the um, physicians in Butte gathered uh, money together and put Aww. a tombstone on To his honor tomb. him. To honor him. That's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we have not mentioned to our audience that this is actually part one yes. of a two-part series. Right. Um, let's just talk a tiny bit about what will be coming up in our next uh, program that people can be looking forward to. Well, we're going to further talk about cultural diversity and, you know, one of the other um, really overlooked groups mm -hmm. is African Americans. Mm -hmm. um, historians have uh, not been very good about finding those stories, but we're beginning to, and I'll be telling some of those stories. Super. Mm -hmm. Well, Ellen, it's always really a pleasure to Thank have you. Thank you so much. You bring such fun stories to tell us about, and uh, I personally always learn some great lessons <laughs> from what you bring to, to tell us about, and we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, Come and see the exhibit. Yeah, it's to really that exhibit. very special. Yeah. Yes, um, and to the second part of this series and you know folks um, we really do have a great state here with a lot of diversity and uh, you really need to learn about it and um, come and see that exhibit uh, for Aging Horizons I'm Kimmy Everman special thanks to the Department of Public Health and Human Services for their continued support Hosts on Aging Horizons are program specialists at the Montana Office on Aging. Production facilities provided by Video Express Productions. For more information about Aging Horizons, call the Department of Public Health and Human Services toll free at 800-332-2272.